thank you so much everyone for joining us today. I know you all have busy schedules, um, but we really appreciate how many, the, uh, the amount of people who responded to our workshop we put together with me and Archer Pinto who's here as well. Uh, so I just want to introduce this workshop a little bit about the UT Portugal program. As was said, I am an assistant professor at UT Austin. My background is in nanoelectronics. Uh, so I've done not very, I've never really worked in the, in the biomedical space, even though I have interest in that area. And so uh, this workshop is really an opportunity to bridge these two fields and to really speak openly with each other. We're hoping that we can have a discussion where everyone across fields can ask questions and um, just get to brainstorm about um, the, the cost section of 2D materials and biomedicine. So as introduced, we have a two day, um, half day workshop. And I want to say a little bit about the UT Austin Portugal program. So this program um, was started, I believe in 2007. So it's been for over um, 10 years. And the purpose of this program is to promote new frontiers of knowledge um, worldwide through advancement of education, research, and commercialization. And uh, here below, I see that there are these different topics. There's technology innovation and entrepreneurship, medical physics, advanced computing, space, earth interactions, and nanotechnologies. These are all areas that this program is particularly interested in these days. And um, here today, we are really focusing on two of these, which is nano and medical physics. So you all have the agenda of the workshop. I'm just listing the two days here. So this first day, um, we're gonna go into, I'm gonna discuss a very general overview of the library of 2D materials. This will be somewhat of a review for those of you who work in 2D materials, but it's an overview of the current um, breadth of materials available, um, kind of giving you a leg up on the literature, the body of literature that exists today on 2D materials. So um, that will be useful for those who have never heard of 2D materials or much about them. And then for those of us who work in the area, it can be a good review. Uh, so then we'll have Dr. Arthur Pinto discuss graphene-based materials for biomedical applications. And then we'll have another talk by Deji Akawande on graphene tattoos for medical applications. And then we have another talk on biosense materials. And then we'll have today's brainstorming session. So that's today. And then when you come back tomorrow, uh, we'll have Zin Tang Lee. He is a, a PhD student in my group, talk about um, more practical details of a particular class of 2D materials called transition metal dichalcogenides, um, their properties, exfoliation, and characterization. Uh, then we'll have Professor Emmanuel Tutuk talk about heterostructures. This is something I'm not gonna really touch on in my general talk today, but it's a very exciting direction for 2D materials, how we can tune their properties by layering them on top of each other. Um, and then we'll have a talk on nanomaterials for immunotherapy, so more on the, on the medical application side, and then on 2D silicon and germanium, so some new 2D materials. And then a second brainstorming session. So that, that's our agenda for the next two days. So I wanna emphasize that this is a workshop, not a conference. And what that means is that questions and discussion are welcome and we really hope that you will um, actively participate. We know this workshop was planned twice. At first, we were hoping it could be hybrid, including in person, because we wanted that interaction with all of us. Of course, being um, virtual, we have the benefit of having a lot more people on the world being able to join. So we appreciate that. But I hope we can keep this um, open discussion throughout. So as Sheila said, um, raising your, you can, you're actually welcome to raise your hand during the talks um, or post questions in the chat or raise your hand and we can call on you at the end of the talks if you wanna speak. Um, don't be afraid to speak out um, when we call on you, you raise your hand to everybody. A graphene, transition metal dichalcogenides and black phosphorus as some of the um, most well-studied classes of 2D materials so far. And then I will give one example of a new material for the library that my group has worked on, which is the Maxine CR2C. So graphene is considered the first atomic sheet material. 
probably many of you are familiar with graphene. In 2004, there was a seminal work by Andre Gaim and Kostya Novoselov, and that led to the 2010 Shared Nobel Prize. And so graphene is this atomically thin structure of carbon atoms shown at the top left in um, the reference two here. Um, it uh, it's atomically thin sheets and then you can layer them as shown in the top right. It also can be rolled up to form carbon nanotubes shown in the bottom left and or you could have carbon atoms in a buckyball shape uh, and more like a quantum dot in the bottom right. So um, the first famous property that graphene showed was that um, you have these massless electrons that it can, can exist at certain momentum points in space. That's what's elucidated by this plot on the right here, where we have energy versus momentum vectors in X and Y. And we can see these points at which um, the valence band and the conduction band meet, and that's where these electrons can behave somewhat like photons. So um, this has a lot of implications for technologies, but even beyond the more details of the physical implications, just the fact that by confining a material to two dimensions, these very new properties arise is really where the strength of 2D materials are. Um, you can have emergent physics that comes from this narrow confinement, and we can make use of that for many applications or we hope to at least. So um, large, so another unique thing about these 2D materials is that they can be exfoliated into very large sheets, sheets that are one atom thick. And so this started out with mechanical exfoliation, literally with tape and peeling a piece of tape and peeling off a single sheet of graphite into graphene. So you can see in the left figure here, um, these very thin um, transparent sheets. And on the right, you can see that when you zoom in to the, uh, uh, the atomic level that we have very ordered, a very ordered crystal, even though it's such a large area. So it's pretty impressive that this is a one micron wide sheet, but it's perfectly atomically thin and ordered. And so um, there's two things here. One that we can have these large area, but then, nano materials and two that we can then have this electron confinement spread over a large area. So these, mater these materials started out mechanically exfoliated into these type of sizes, but as the field has grown, uh, many methods have come up for um, growing these materials to very large scales, full wafer scales that can be used for electronic applications. So um, there are different forms of graphene. It can be a pristine graphene grown, and it can be grown on a single or by layers or a few layers thick. So as I said, we, we started out being, doing this with tape exfoliation. And one of the methods now for large area is chemical vapor deposition. So here we can have monolayer thick um, material that can be up to 300 millimeters in diameter or bigger. So a lot of the applications for this type of graphene are electronics, biosensing, and many others. And in terms of products that have been produced to date with graphene, um, there has been work on high frequency field effect transistors, also transparent conducting electrodes. This graphene is a conductor and it's optically transparent. It's also flexible. And so there's also um, technologies using it for transparent touch screens since it's conductive and we can see through it. So you can see how, how it can be grown on these full wafers. So um, the wafer type graphene is really where the core of people like me working in electronics are using 2D, material, 2D materials. But for biomedical applications and chemical applications, um, there's a second form of graphene, which is suspended nanoflakes. So here often, instead of um, single layer growth or exfoliation, um, chemical exfoliation is done to um, have small sizes. So here you might like, want micrometer down to 100 nanometer sizes, but large volume density in an aqueous solution. So um, you can think of these as, in a way, two distinct cl classes of 2D materials. 
uh, or at least two different forms that can be used very differently. So um, this was uh, this is the paper where um, they they showed a method for creating this aqueous graphene. And uh, there to date, the, the commercial applications of, of graphene have actually seen a larger amount of applications for suspended nanoflake type graphene. So um, a couple example products to date. One that caught my eye is um, neuronal regeneration. So here they found that if they took these graphene nanoflakes and they put them along where neurons had died, um, the structure of the flat structure of them even though they're suspended in, in this liquid solution, helps the neurons regenerate along the, the direction that is desired. Um, so they're, 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 they're really making use of the atomically thin flat structure of these nanoflakes. Um, another major current commercialization of suspended nanoflake graphene is um, lightweight strong foams for cars. So this is um, done by Ford and they, took the suspended graphene and then they developed a process to make it into a foam. And then they found that having these um, thin flakes in the foam could make it very mechanically strong while being very lightweight, which is um, really important for, for um, vehicle applications. Okay, so as we move beyond graphene, to the larger library of 2D materials, what does moving beyond graphene really get us? And one of the main things is that we can engineer the band gap of the material by choosing the right material, choosing its thickness, and deciding um, and, then, and then controlling that band gap by how it's strained, what substrates it's on, what other materials it's interfaced with. Uh, so this band gap engineering is one of the major reasons to look beyond graphene to the larger library of 2D materials that exist today. When I talk about band gap, that refers to the energy, the light matter interaction that can take place in these materials to have light absorb electrons or vice versa. And so you can see this picture here, you can have light coming in and um, pretending on the band gap is going to different wavelengths of light will get absorbed by the material. Um, so this band gap engineering is useful for optoelectronics or any kind of 2D material interaction with light. Uh, it's also useful for electronics on the right here for making things like transistors where depending on the band gap, we will require a different voltage to operate our transistor devices. So one of the first 2D materials beyond graphene was MOS2 shown here which while graphene is a metal, MOS2 is a semiconductor. And so we can gate it and have a transistor. So as we look at the larger library of 2D materials, there are a few different ways we can organize the different materials that are present for us to work with. So one of the ways that's commonly done is by conductivity. So this is a nice plot um, from this work on the different types of materials versus their conductivity. So we have insulator 2D materials and the classic one is hexagonal boron nitride, HBN. And you can see here, they write down the band gap. It's greater than five electron volts. That means it's very much an insulator. We have semiconductor 2D materials like the MOS2 I mentioned. Uh, the class of transition metal dichalcogenides are here in this class. So we also have double SE2, um, and, and other ones in this area. Um, then we have materials that are half metallic, like these chromium based materials, including the CR2C that we were studying in our lab. Then we have our semi metals and our metals. And we also have new 2D materials today that are superconductors as well. So they really can bridge this range of different um, types of conductive materials. And then we, in addition to, compared to bulk materials, what we really have is this confined electron behavior that leads to new behaviors, this heterostructuring, this um, flat atomically, atomic plane for, for different interaction with other ions and sensing applications and flexibility. So um, this, this, these types of materials that exist in the bulk have these extra properties that we can take advantage of when they exist in the, in the 2D material atomic plane.
so diving a little bit more into the material versus its band gap versus its layer number, as I said, we can engineer this band gap not only by choosing the material, but then by choosing how many atomic layers of these sheets we layer on top of each other. And that can help us um, tune this band gap and therefore tune how this material will, will optically or electrically respond. Uh, so this is a plot where they've, they've shown the current literature on this for 2D semiconductors in the bottom versus the band gap energy. And that's compared to conventional semiconductors at the top. And so we can see where all of these different 2D materials lie. So we have MOS2, MOSE2, we have our tungsten based ones. Um, we have HBN over on the right here with the band gap of five electron volts. Um, this particular paper was on black phosphorus and showing that it could have a very wide range of tuning of its band energy. Um, and so this, in, in this paper, this, this, these ranges shown are not just for, they're combining layering and also things like strain effects and stuff that have been shown to um, tune this, this energy of the band gap. And so another thing to point out here is that we can really, um, through these different materials, um, we can look at the wavelengths that we're operating in. So a lot of these 2D materials today are operating in the near IR, the visible, um, this range over here. Okay, so, so far I organized these, this library of 2D materials by connectivity. We also can instead organize by structure. So we have the 2D materials that have single layer atomic structure and graphene is the classic example, hexagonal boron nitride. And then we have other ones that have been developed, um, silicine, borophene, and then a few other st staining here. Uh, and then a second class of structure is metal calcogenides, metal calcogenides, and they usually have what's called a puckered structure. And the main class here are these transitional metal decalcogenides, which, as I said, are the most mature 2D materials after graphene that have been studied heavily in the last 10 years. So these have um, MX2 type structure, where M is the transition metal, and X2 is the decalcogen, group 3, 4, or group 4, 6 element. Sorry, 3, 6, or 4, 6 element. Okay, and then another structure we have are transition metal carbides and nitrides. And um, one example here are, is the class of materials called maxines. Um, so they have M, N plus one, X, N structure, where M is a transition metal and X is usually carbon or nitrogen. And so these are three examples of major classes of different structured 2D materials, but there are now many more to include in the 2D material library. Okay, so now that we have these, this library of tuning materials that can be order, ordered by connectivity or by structure, um, we can also look at how this fits into the different applications that um, the community is looking for applying to new materials. And so you can look online and find many of this type of plot, but very different flavor of applications that have been put on this type of circular plot. Um, so I just picked this one because it included spintronics, which is an area that I work in. Um, so depending on these different tunable properties of these 2D materials, we can um, choose the appropriate one for the application. And that's getting to one of the core um, goals of this work workshop is to really think about, okay, so if we take this library as a whole and we think about the applications that are needed in biomedicine and where we have seen graphene succeed so well, um, what are the new properties that we need and therefore which 2D materials should be the ones that are good candidates for these properties and or which new 2D materials need to be developed for these applications. So um, today our focus is on biomedical applications, but just to show you that there are other um, heavily invested applications. So Spintronics is an area that my group has done a lot of work in and here um, we can use particular 2D materials and generate spin currents along their edges, which can be used to process information, similar to how um, currently electrical charge is used to process information. And there's also a lot of work on sensors and that ties well into the biomedical applications because these 2D materials are essentially all edge, all surface. 
And so the surface interactions can um, very finely affect their properties and therefore they can be used as sensors. And then uh, another major area of applications is in flexible electronics and low power electronics, where we make use of the flexibility and also on how we can strain these two materials as we bend them. Okay, so um, now I wanna go into just some of the um, most well-studied 2D materials after graphene in this library. So the first ones are these transition metal decalcogenides. So a little bit about their properties. They are semiconductors. They're somewhat air stable, mostly air stable. And um, they're prepared by mechanical exfoliation and chemical vapor deposition. The current applications seen are in electronics, spintronics, and other areas. And I'm going to keep it brief here because Zintang Li, who is a PhD student in my group, will give a more detailed talk on TMDs tomorrow morning. Um, the, but the four main TMDs are the four listed here, MOS2, WSE2, MOSE2, and WSE2. Uh, this image here is an uh, an optical microscope image of a WSE2 transistor that was fabricated by Zintong Li. Uh, so you can see the monolayer material outlined in yellow here. And we have these electrodes on either side. And you can see how very clean these materials can be with you can see um, no defects at this optical level. At the right here, you can see the structure of the TMDs in the monolayer. And then if we have um, multiple layers. So one of the nice properties of TMDs is that their band gap goes, or trans goes through a transition based on layer number from an indirect band gap to a direct band gap. So the monolayer of MS2 shown here has a direct band gap um, in terms of where the valence band and the junction band meet in K space. And then as you go to a bilayer and a bulk, they have indirect band gaps. And so what this is saying is that um, you can choose your layer number to affect how light is, you're not only gonna affect the, the value of the band gap, but how light will interact with this material through what mechanism. Okay, so a second uh, class or second material that's well studied after graphene is black phosphorus. So this, uh, material caught everyone's attention because it is it has a good band gap for electronic applications. It's a semiconductor like the TMDs. A challenge with black phosphorus, it is not air stable. So um, careful work has to be done when working with it to work in a low oxygen environments. Uh, it's prepared also by mechanical exfoliation, CVD, or other methods. Um, something called chemical transport reaction is also used and is also fine and a lot of applications in electronics, such as transistors. So um, down here in part A here, you see the, um, the structure of black phosphorus. In B, again, versus layer number, you can see this band gap here in energy versus, versus momentum. So um, getting smaller as we increase layer number. And that's shown in, in C here. So this is the band gap versus number of layers for different methods of preparing the black phosphorus. So these different colors here are different methods. And some are theoretical. The, the circle ones here are theoretical um, predictions of the black phosphorus band gap. And then the squares here are experimental, um, what they measured through different methods about the band gap. So you can see it can vary quite a bit on theory and an experiment and depending on um, how it's prepared and depending on the number of layers. And then the third um, example material is hexagon boron nitride, which is often referred to as graphene's insulating brother. It has a very similar structure to graphene, but made with boron nitride. It's an insulator, it's air stable, and similar preparation methods. And it's used for these heterostructures like Emmanuel Chukchuk is gonna talk about tomorrow. Um, encapsulation, so things like when you take that black phosphorus and you, you can put some HBN on top of it to, to then preserve its stability when you take it out of the glove box. So here are some images of these HBN films. Um, again, you can see they're atomically thin.
So for these major classes of 2D materials, we can compare, compare their properties. Um, so here is a nice comparison of the material versus, so in the, in the left here, so first of all, we have these different colors, which is blue is for graphene, black is for black phosphorus, and red is for these TMDs, this transition metal decalcogenized. So for these three different types of 2D materials, we can compare a number of their properties. So on the left here in A is their mobility. So um, that's, that corresponds to how easily electrons can move in these materials. And then versus their on-off ratio when made into a transistor. So, um, so when, when you, you use a gate and a, and a source drain electrode and put it on the 2D material. So we can see where graphene lies, it has the highest mobility, which is expected because we know that electrons are very photon-like in graphene. And then we have black phosphorus and we have the TMDCs, which have um, somewhat similar mobilities and, um, but different on-off ratios. And so these are just from various uh, different works of literature, these different points here. Another thing we can compare is their response, the responsivity of photodetectors made out of these materials. So these are materials that are then detecting photons and um, we can see their responsivity and their response time. Again, looking at graphene versus black phosphorus and then the TMDs have this wide range because there are a number of TMDs included here. Another device type that's been developed is um, for um, thermoelectrics. And there the characteristic um, constant is the Seebeck coefficient, which tells us um, the current versus temperature relation in the material. So here you're trying to use heat to create electricity in these materials. So, um, and that's compared to the resistivity in the materials. So we can again see that the TMDs have high Seebeck coefficients, but higher resistivity, which makes sense because they're semiconductors. So um, we could consider making similar plots for the important parameters in biomedical engineering and depending on what application you're looking at to pick out which of these materials are most desired for the particular application. Okay, how am I doing on time? I think I have five more minutes. Is that right? Yes, three five. minutes. Great, okay, perfect. It's fine. Three minutes. Three minutes. Yeah, I'll try to. I don't. I don't need to make it too long. Okay, okay. so I'm almost done. Um, so I just want to mention that I I kind of dove into the most well studied 2D materials beyond graphene in this library, but I just want to mention that there are other very exciting material types. So one is superconducting. Um, here was a very nice paper where they looked at a bunch of different superconducting materials, and here these are the more suspended type materials but they were still able to get these flakes that they could observe. Um, another large class in this library of 2D materials, and this is an area that we study in my group, are magnetic 2D materials. And um, this is a very exciting thing because if you had asked us five years ago, we would have said that there were no magnetic 2D materials. And now look at all these ones that are predicted and some of them have been made. So. Um, we can plot them versus their critical field and their transition temperature when they go from magnetic to non-magnetic. And we also have, we have all types of magnetic ones. We have anti-ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic. So um, it, it's a large number of materials to consider for your applications. Okay, so in the last two minutes, I will just briefly mention a new material for the library, which is CR2C, which our group has been working on um, making a reality. So this is a material that was predicted to be perhaps magnetic and metallic, perhaps or half metallic, um, but it was only done in theory. And so not much was known about it, its stability, not so sure. Um, one of the challenges of this type of 2 material is that it cannot be mechanically separated into 2D sheets, but has to be chemically etched into 2D sheets. So that's what we were working on here is developing the chemical process to produce these sheets. And uh, we imagine the applications could be for things like magnetic field shielding and spintronics. So, and see here, you can see from one of our recent papers, how this, this bulk material is becoming 2D-like as we chemically um, remove these, um, the atoms that are in between the layers. And so you can get this um, kind of book sheet-like look 
to the to the material. Um, here's a little bit more details about this year 2 C. I'm going to skip forward to in interest of time. But we have these layers and we etch, etch out these A atoms to create the sheets. And then they become functionalized at the top and bottom of them. And so here's some more results of our etching method. So you can see the unetched bulk, what it looks like. And then after etching, we can get, again, these accordion structures as they become um, separated into these sheets. And we optimize the process and we can we can in investigate them with different met methods such as x-ray diffraction on the left here. Um, we can analyze what species are there after the exfoliation and see how the 2D material has different interaction with x-rays than the bulk material. And on the right here, we can also look at it in transition electron microscopy to start to analyze the sheet-like properties of the material. Okay, so in conclusion, there is a large library of 2D materials that provides tunable materials for electrical, optical, physical, magnetic responses, which have many applications in biomedicine. Um, the, I want to emphasize how the 2D, what does the 2D nature provide for us? And what it provides is unique electron confide properties, atomically flat structures and flexible structures. Uh, materials in this library are at very different stages of development with more mature materials available commercially. So some of these materials you can buy off the shelf. And the applications can be divided into two categories as I see it. There are the pristine mono to few layer materials grown large scale, which are finding applications in electronics and similar fields. And then there's the suspended solutions of flakes with various layer number. And those are finding applications maybe more in the chemical space. I'll end there. Perfect. Thank you so much for your interesting presentation, Professor Jinan. I haven't received any questions in the chat, but I just want to give everyone an opportunity to ask questions. So if you have your question, do you want to raise a hand and ask it verbally? Or should we move on? I saw one question that came to me directly. Okay, so feel mistake. free. Yeah. Nope. Um, Rajendra, I think you, you asked, what is the main reason for the degradation of the black phosphorus? Oxygen, light, moisture, or a combination of all? Um, that is a really good question. Um, it, it's not air stable at all. So I think all of those things affect it. I know Zintong, you've worked with black phosphorus. You want to comment anymore on, on why it's not air, why it's so bad at being air stable? Yeah, I think uh, it's a combination of all those factors. Yeah, yeah. including uh, uh, moisture, yeah. Moisture, yeah. So, and, and it's a good point, Rajendra, like, a lot of these, even even the um, the TMDs are air, considered air stable, but in our lab, we still consider that we don't want them like exposed to air for months and months. They will start, they, they should really be encapsulated. I saw another hand raised. I saw it too, but maybe it was a mistake because the person took, uh, lowered the hand immediately. Okay. So I guess we're going to move on to our next presentation. Uh, so next up, we have the second coordinator of this workshop, Dr. Turpintu. Oops. Can I make a question to Janan? Oh, please go ahead. I have two minutes, so let's, let's go forward. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, and then I'd like to ask you which of uh, those materials do you think it's more promising for biomedical application? Uh, so my initial inclination is and I think what the field is showing is these TMDs, um, especially for things, because things like what you're interested in, like light interaction, and then that interacting with the with whatever you're trying to treat, um, they have this direct band gap that's tunable. And so I think that that's probably the first direction to look is these, these semiconductor type tuning materials and they're stable, which is nice, yeah. Right. I've actually, Thank sorry. You. I've actually received a question and I'm gonna to try to pronounce this. The question is, don't we have more data on CR2C? Don't we have more data on CR2C? Um, exactly. So there is a lot of theoretical um, density functional theory that's been done on CR2C. Um, in this paper where we were um, showing it in exfoliation, we, we had XRD data and we have we have some magnetic field data to try to explore its ferromagnetism that was predicted. And we see some signatures of ferromagnetism, but we haven't published that yet, partially because the thing is that we're exfoliating into this mixed state of some of the parent material and some of the 2D material. 
And so right now we can't with enough confidence say that the ferromagnetic signatures we're seeing are just due to the 2D material. So we need to do more work of, of isolating it from its parent structure first.